Hi everyone, this is Jennifer from Tarl Speech with your Tarl Speech interview series. And today I have a very special guest, Vince Ritchie. And Vince has been a full-time admissions consultant since 2002. In 2007, he started his own business after deciding he wanted to work with only the best students aiming for the top schools. After serving on the board for six years, including one year as president, Vince serves on the governance committee of the Association of International Graduate Admission Consultants. He is also a college and graduate school counselor at the shortlist. Beyond admissions counseling, Vince has been utilizing the improvisational theater skills he developed as the founding education director of Stanford Improvisers to create intercultural learning and development communities at multinational corporations and universities. Currently, he is a course assistant for the Stanford Continuing Studies course, Everyday Spontaneity, Improvising Our Lives. Vince has also been invited to lecture at the University of Tokyo Graduate School of Engineering. Vince received the Lions Award for Service from Stanford University, where he earned his BA in History in 1992. Before moving to Tokyo in 2002, Vince completed his MA in the Digital Media Design for Learning at NYU. While living in New York, he served as founding technologist at Columbia University Center for New Media, Teaching, and Learning. He and his wife are raising a bilingual, bicultural son in California and Japan. So everyone, join me in welcoming Vince Ritchie. Hello, Vince. Welcome. How are you today? Doing great, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. So um, Vince and I met, for those of you um, who are curious, when I taught um, a live class in Tokyo many years ago um, with Donald Miller at E4TG. And thanks to social media, we've kept in touch. Um, and recently I saw on one of your posts that you were doing improv and it really intrigued me. And I think I chatted with you on your post and, um, got really excited about it. So tell me a little bit, let's get started. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell me about you. Tell me about when you were a young Vince and your education. Thank you. So I would say music and theater really brought me out of my shell. I was pretty terrified all the time as a kid. Mm -hmm. I studied hard and whatever, was good in school. Wasn't that great at sports, some anxiety issues. Um, I had friends, mm -hmm. but theater, uh, music and theater really brought me out. I don't mean musical theater. I don't sing and dance that well. I mean, yeah. I dance. I wasn't like in um, Gilbert and Sullivan shows or something. I mean like music, like playing guitar and bass and then... Mm -hmm theater but then when i got to college well sorry i'm going too fast that's okay um just as a kid let's just say that i had some anxiety mm -hmm. um, and then i'll tell you what happened afterwards <laughs> yeah actually that's funny that you say that i also had anxiety and just funny side story i didn't talk for like a year in school i wouldn't talk to anyone at school um so tell me a little bit about that and i will tell you as we go along how i got over it too so how That's amazing, get, right? Because how did you get over this? Yeah, um, I had a speech pathologist, so I had some pronunciation issues. Okay, uh, I had a Maryland R, which I'm sure okay. you know all about. <laughs> like I uh -huh. said, you know, I fear. Like it's not fair. I used to say it a lot. Yeah, um, I had lived on the East Coast, but yeah, I was born in Oakland, California. So I was like this little East Coast kid, even though I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then I stuttered, and I remember mm -hmm. going on stage in like Cub Scouts and I had written a little script and I was going to do a little monologue with a puppet mm -hmm. and I just totally froze on the stage mm -hmm. like a very typical moment of just stage fright and mm -hmm. stuff so that's my little story yeah <laughs> so what did your speech therapist do I'm actually a speech therapist that's my training so what did you learn from your speech therapist that really helped you that maybe other people can kind of implement as well she was just really kind and really patient. Patient. Mm -hmm. There was just no judgment at all, either explicit or implicit. She just mm -hmm. was just a sweet person. Wish I remember her name. I remember it was second grade, and I would mm -hmm. like get up and leave class and yeah. go off to meet her. And I was always like looking forward to it because, and I, as I recall, it was simply just repetition. Like 
really just training my mouth uh -huh. to pronounce the letter R. Okay. As okay. most people pronounce it, as opposed to the way it's pronounced in certain subcultures, you know, mm -hmm. in Maryland, for example, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so bottom line is practice makes perfect, which I kind of say all the time. And some of my students don't like that answer. But um, <laughs> by the way, you did a beautiful job because your communication is perfect. Um, so keep going about your um, your education and your childhood. So, yeah, pre-college um, started playing in bands because didn't do really didn't do sports, but I liked groups. So music was a way to. Uh, especially when my guitar teacher looked at me one day and said, Vince, you have really good rhythm. You don't practice that much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why don't you switch to bass? Because there were like 10 guitarists in my middle school. You know, this mm -hmm. was in the 80s and everyone wanted to be Eddie Van Halen or whatever. Yeah. So he's like, he's like, bass, do bass. And I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. And then that was great because I could always be in a band, right? No one was, in those days, there wasn't bass wasn't cool yet so mm -hmm. um you were just like that other guy in the back with the drummer uh mm -hmm. it was fine so i could you know hang back but still contribute something so being in bands was really cool being on stage so ba I, basically i could be on a stage mm -hmm. but i have to talk and i wasn't the front man at to sing but that kind of helped me get over it right um just like hey people like this this is fun i'm enjoying it they're enjoying it you know and that was a great um early transition to yeah to to later life so bringing, sort of building your confidence, um, learning how to stand in front of people, kind of being, um, putting, putting yourself out there without having to really communicate. Is that correct? Okay. So then this is high school. What about college? What did you do for college? So I got to, I got to college and uh, my first, it was like orientation and you could shop around mm -hmm. and I was naturally gravitating towards the theater department. Interesting. Um, okay. Because, you know, that's what I'd done. I also had done drama in high school and it was yeah. kind of my core friend group where the drama mm -hmm. geeks, right, or whatever mm -hmm. we call ourselves. And, you know, I was in plays and enjoyed that mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah. I was like, gee, let me go check out the theater department here. And it wasn't very competitive. You know, it's not, it wasn't like going to USC or something. Stanford Theater is kind of like an afterthought, unfortunately. Oh, really? Okay. Um, that well, surprises you know, me. Okay. So Dorney Weaver went there, but th that, she's like the only one I think I can point to. Okay. You know, as opposed to numerous Supreme Court justices or whatever. Okay, got it, got it. Or Tiger Woods. Like, you, you know, there wasn't like a thing. You didn't go to Stanford to do performing arts so much, yeah. I guess. Especially now, okay. right? It's all computer science. But even back then, it was like pre-med. Yeah, got it. Pretty much. So, yeah, so I just gravitated there. I figured I'd find friends and like-minded folks, and I did. And then I saw this this professor, and she made a presentation about she was just beginning to offer improv. She was, she is, or was the acting teacher. She taught almost all the acting courses. Mm -hmm. And the most popular course in the drama department was her improv, you know, 101, basically 103, I think it was called. And it was hard to get into, but I mm -hmm. got in. Good for um, you. Okay. And then I was, I was hooked because, and I, I'm literally in her house at the moment, as we make this video, she just changed my life. I mean, people say that it sounds cliche, but, uh, because she herself is a bit introverted and she herself overcame some stuff and, and just, I resonated with sort of everything she did and everything she said and everything. She spent tons of time in Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just the whole Asia thing and spirituality, you know, she's a Buddhist and, and really, you know, sincere about a lot of things. And she's um, just a great listener. So I basically majored in her, as I say in, in, in one of my YouTube videos. I mean, I just followed her around. <laughs> it was like, I just okay, want to be like a groupie. I, I love that. So <laughs> I'm trying to piece this all together. So I'm, I'm loving all of this. So you have this like anxiousness when you're a kid, you do some theater, you gain some confidence, you get into Stanford, you're in theater, you take this improv class. So did you go on to do improv right after college or did you do something else? I taught, I mean, we, we were chatting right earlier. I mean, improv for teachers. So I, I took all her acting courses. Mm -hmm. I did a few plays, not a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't like auditions because I don't like rejection. So okay. I knew I was never going to make it uh, as a theater, as a stage actor, or I never even tried to do film. It wasn't my point. I wasn't, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, the concept of applied improvisation. So in the classroom, um, as a history teacher down in New Orleans, we played games all the time. I never labeled it as such, but I would use some of the techniques and especially the listening. Because mm -hmm. as you know, listening yeah. 
improv is about listening. It's actually not about being funny mm-hmm. so much necessarily. That can be the outcome, but that's mm-hmm. never the intention. The intention is to collaborate with people and trust people um, and, you know, form really quick bonds with people. So all of that stuff was useful. So, no, I went and became a teacher. I taught improv at that school. Okay. After, you know, but again, not as like an official course, just as an extra thing. I wasn't in the drama department. I was in the history department. Okay. So you're also in um, admissions counseling. So how does that tie in with the improv and doing that in college with then moving into ad- admissions counseling? Because it sounds like two totally different things. Or Yeah, or is it, it? it totally does. Um, but the big concept of improv that I love, the way Patricia teaches it, and her mentor was this guy, Keith Johnstone, so there's the Chicago school and then there's a sort of Keith Johnstone school. And I love both. Um, uh, but my professor is, you know, Keith Johnstone would come and work with us. His whole thing was one of his things was um, status, of course, a different topic. We probably won't get into that one today, although that's what we're teaching tonight. But th- what I'm trying to get to is shared control. So as, as an admissions counselor, especially with adults, my main work for 20 years has been with professional people ages 23 to 35, let's say, average 27, let's say, they're professionals and they're not coming to me like a 17 year old would sort of looking for answers. They're looking for advice. And I absolutely have to respect them, especially you and I met in Japan. My, I started doing this work in Japan. Mm-hmm. So the two key concepts for me with them was, was shared control, meaning that I would approach them as a partner. And my superpower is really listening. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife sometimes says I don't listen well enough, and I get it. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really try, uh, okay. especially if it's a professional situation. So I, I listen very, very deeply to what's being said and also body language, what's not being said and what's being held back. That's good. And, um, so I don't know if this is answering your question, but to it me, is. they're all related in a very specific kind of way. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about shared control? Because before this, Vince and I were chatting. I also did improv classes or took improv classes in Chicago. And it sounds like it's different. And I don't know what shared control means. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, in the so in the class that I'm teaching right now with, with Patricia, or she's teaching and I'm her course assistant, she demonstrates it with a whiteboard. So she puts a whiteboard up in Zoom and it's, you know, a whiteboard. So it's just, just like, welcome to class. Please doodle. Mm-hmm. And people are like, ooh, cool. How do I, ooh, boom. I'll, mm-hmm. you know, I'll make a heart. Ooh, I'll draw a flower. I'll make a rainbow. Um, I'll, you know, whatever, draw a river, a cloud. Mm-hmm. And then you, the idea is that it's like everyone's contributing something and there's no boss. Um, and it's also like I tell my clients, when you get to MBA, for example, there isn't, people have kind of status or expectation or an ego for sure. But you're in a study group with five people. If you go to Kellogg, right, everything's in a team or London Business School. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no one in charge. The professor doesn't say, you know, okay, so and so, you're leading this project. Mm-hmm. So it's shared control again, where it's like, um, we got to work this out. It's a very uh, natural sort of team environment. Mm-hmm. But but more specifically to improv, we just when you're on a stage, if you're in a, if you and I are doing a scene, um, and I'm like leading the whole time it gets really frustrating for you and also boring for the audience. It's much more interesting if we're each adding something to the scene and respecting each other's additions and trying to figure this out, you know, okay, give me a suggestion for a location and an object. And Mm -hmm. then that's shared control because the audience is giving us objects. Then you and I have to come up with a scene using, you know, in a car uh, with a broomstick so what are we doing? In, why we have a broomstick in the car? We got to work this out. Right. Find out that I'm a witch or whatever. You know. Yeah. Like we're just working this out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm assuming it's part of the Chicago school, but just maybe not with that name. The idea is yeah. just collaborative creation. Okay. So I get that. So in my opinion, my professional opinion, because I work with a lot of people who are not. Um, from the U.S., they're non-native speakers, and there are cultural differences. I find a lot of my students are very, um, I'm going to call it shy, but that's not really the right word. They are less apt to ask me a question 
to interrupt. And I think that that's a skill that people really need for graduate school. So um, can you tell me how, how do my students learn more? Number one, it's going to be a big question. How do they learn more about improv and maybe take a class in it? And why should they take a class in improv? Let's start with the why, and then we'll go to the how. So why should a student take improv if they're in another country speaking a different language? What, what are they going to gain from this? Confidence. Mm -hmm. In a word. Yeah. Um, confidence that they can learn how it's a new skill. They can learn how to raise their hand. Yeah. Uh, make a suggestion, make a contribution, answer a question or not panic if they get cold called, which mm -hmm. some schools do. Yeah. Um, that's one. Mm -hmm. um, what about creativity? I'm thinking about creativity from a very um, business perspective, because I think a lot of people hear creativity and they think about, oh, I'm going to write this novel or write this piece of fiction. And I think of creativity very differently in terms of like, I'm going to be able to think of a question or think of a topic to discuss or think of maybe some words that you need to practice. So how do you, how do you apply that creativity? Um, and I think I'm putting words in your mouth because I so believe in improv too. And I think everyone to take a class in it. So tell me a little bit more about that and how that kind of helps maybe someone getting into a university. Yeah. So it's, I would say we teach people in our classes to be normal. Don't yeah. try to be clever. Just say the normal, obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Lovely weather today, isn't it? Yeah, a little cloudy though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like just a com You don't have to, you know, you shout out to the audience, hey, can I have a suggestion for a room? You don't want someone to say like, you know, um, an ER room on Mars. Like yes. the scene's already done. Right, right, exactly, exactly. You're like, still right on that because that's always how about like sabotage. Just the <laughs> yeah. So keep it simple. Um, there's so much here. It's, it's, I'm, I'm trying. My head's spinning with thought, things to say, and I'm trying to be focused. Um, you, you, I want to interview you for one sec because you were telling me before the call you you heard about an improv class in Chicago and you were you were averse to doing it and then you took it and you liked it. What did you love about it? I loved that it pushed me to be uncomfortable and to be confident in my own thoughts um, and just to be comfortable in my skin. And I think getting back to what you said is it's not about the most clever answer. It's about that listening piece and being in the moment and being creative in that is that it's almost like this laser focus um, as opposed to just trying to make it funny. And I find that the people who tried to make it funny were never funny. And the funny people, it was sort of always just, it just kind of happened and it kind of flowed. And it was from that sort of shared control, as you called it, but ultimately, you had to pay attention and you had to listen because if you got off for one second, then you couldn't keep up with what everyone else had been doing. I think for me, it was definitely that that confidence and believing in myself and just not being afraid to speak up, which is one of my biggest issues is sort of not always wanting to be assertive. And you have to learn how to be Kindly assertive, I will say. <laughs> you don't have to like take control, but you do have to sort of insert yourself into things some of the time. So that's kind of what I got out of it. And it was scary. I will say, <laughs> like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Improv was scary at first because you really are doing something that we don't typically do on a daily basis. So would you agree with that? It's a little bit scary. Yeah. But I think people should still 
take a class. I just, re I really believe in it. This is a hard sell. I think everyone <laughs> needs to take an improv class. It's just great for your confidence. Um, it's great for thinking on your feet. It's great for your listening skills. And for those of you out there who are afraid to sort of put yourself out there when you're speaking, I think this is for you. So let's cut to the chase, Vince. You are leading a class. Tell me about it, what's happening in this class, and how can people sign up and take part in it? Yeah, so my website is vinceprep.com, and it's you can find it on my site. Just search for improvisation on my site. or There's various ways, but um, my YouTube is also Vince Prep, and I'm talking a lot about it these days. I'm going to make a new video soon about the course. It's five weeks, um, and I'll be um, flexible about it. I it's funny staying with Patricia, who's her book sold 100,000 copies. It's called Improv Wisdom, and it's in nine languages. And so, but still, and we talk a lot before the class, which is tonight, class number seven. But then I joined the class as her TA, and she's improvising. She's going with the flow. She's adjusting, but mm -hmm. it's fun. So I'll be doing the same thing. But I have on the website what each week, each week sort of has a theme, really basic stuff like narrative and character. And it's, it's useful for actors, but as you were saying, it's also useful for teachers or professionals or students. I've also taught it for families. This oh, that's fine. This course won't be if, – if any, I put this out there. But if, any, if any families um, um, in, Utah, in Salt Lake City, Utah, a professor, his wife who's an educator, and their daughter who's homeschooled joined me during COVID. And it was a way for them to have, like, playtime, and I was facilitating the games. Mm-hmm. That was so fun. I've done it with middle school kids in London. Also during the pandemic, a friend reached out and I, she's like, my kids really want to take improv, but we're in the middle of this thing. So can you put together a course for us? So I, I've done this in all kinds of, and I've done it for corporations in Tokyo and California too. And this, of course, this course that we're doing tonight, which is for adults. So the one in April is for adults just because I needed to start somewhere, but right. I can do it for any group. And I don't want to do it for one person. Um, but five or six and even numbers are better. So like if you can get four friends, three friends, mm -hmm. I'll do it for any group of four. I'm trying to make this a bigger and bigger part of my professional focus and my offering. So I'm making it flexible pricing as, as well as flexible, um, sort of pay what you can at the moment until I can really get traction with this, because it's just something that I'm really looking at my life and I love admissions. Um, and I love I have nothing more exciting than the, getting the email. I just got one this morning. Mm -hmm. I, got in, I got in and it's you feel like you're changing someone's life. And I love that feeling. And I'll never stop doing admissions work because it's a skill set. And I love sharing it with people and seeing them achieve their dreams. And also, um, I want to give I want to get back to the stuff that pulled me out of my shell. I think you, you're probably very similar, right? You're doing work that was yeah. transformative for you because you didn't talk for a year. And yeah, um, <laughs> yes. I, I think you know exactly what I'm what, what I'm trying to say here. So I'm open to any offers and any opportunities. There is a class currently Monday night starting in April. It's on my website. And that's virtual, correct? So anyone yeah. can do that. Okay. It's, it's on Zoom. I can do it live if it works out. I'm in California till August. I'll be back in Japan after that. If a group wants me live, sure. Okay. But for now, yeah, just using Zoom. Okay. All right. So let me summarize for everyone out there. So again, we have Vince Ritchie. Thank you so much for being here. VincePrep.com is his website. He's also on YouTube at Vince Prep. Um, do you have the little app with Vince Prep now for YouTube? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> they changed things up there on YouTube. Yeah, they um, did. He's teaching an improv class that is five weeks in April for adults, ideally four to six people, even There's numbers. There's already three, already three signed up. So it's awesome. going to We need one more. Come on, people. Someone sign up. <laughs> I personally think this is great for everyone. I think if you are looking for – just a fun class to take to really push yourself. Do this. If you're afraid, you need to sign up even more. It's amazing. It will change your life. Um, I also wanted to shout out about your um, the book again. What was the name of the book? Improv Wisdom? Yeah, I wish I had a copy. There's okay. copies all around. 
improv. We'll put, I'll wisdom. put it in the links. No worries. I'll have it in the links below um, this video. I'll also put all of Vince's socials um, and links there. And also, I love the idea of people just reaching out to you to schedule a class for a group. Like, I think if you're a group of friends, and we're with a lot of friends, like one person will come to me and then another person will. Um, if you are all trying to get into graduate school in the U.S. and you don't live in the U.S., I think this is a great way to learn about the culture of um, the U.S. from Vince. Also to work on some listening skills with an American native English speaker um, and to work on that shared control, working in a group, all of those skills that you're going to need in grad school. And then I think this would also be helpful when you're doing interviewing, even though you're prepared, you know, I think it's helpful to then, um, you know, be able to just kind of pivot a little bit, um, depending on the question, um, that is asked. So Vince, do you have anything else that you want to add before we sign off? I think you nailed it. Cause you okay. mentioned the interview piece. I was going to say, that's what's kept me doing MBA admissions for 20 years is you can't really get into a top program without the interview. And so that's where I really get to pour it on and, and use all that training. Yeah. I can. And I think this is also, if I can add something on top of that, now that you have these videos that you have to submit, that you get the question and then you have a video, I think this improvisation and, and feeling a little more comfortable is even more important. I work with some people who are amazing and they just don't come across well in that quick video response sometimes. And I think that this class um, that Vince is teaching in improv would really help you. So can I, I, I can I share one more quick anecdote? Yeah, please. I worked with a student of mine yesterday who we were doing mock interviews for a uh, school and she was using chat GPT and I could totally tell. Yeah the answers were like so perfect, but also vapid, just mm -hmm. empty, nothing there. Yep. Um, but it was cool because she admitted it and we laughed mm -hmm. and then it was useful. And I actually encourage people to give that a first try and then sort of tear it all apart or find the one keyword in there. So I, I'm not worried about things like that. Actually, I think if you use it as a tool, I wonder how you feel about that. That's a whole different podcast topic. But um, it was the first time a client's actually admitted to me that they're using it. And then we could laugh about it and I could encourage her to like, it wasn't like I scolded her. I was like, oh, that's so funny. Well, you know, use it and then go beyond it or use it and then build something that's more, you know, personal from it. Again, that's a huge topic, but I do think <laughs> that everything is a tool. And as long as you use it as a tool to help you come up with your thoughts, I think that it's, that it's fine. Sometimes I also find with my students who aren't native English speakers it's that sort of, I know in my head what I want to say, here's what I want to say, but then kind of like getting it sort of formulated a little bit. Um, so again, I think to pull out a nugget or help with organization, it's it's a tool. And I think that, you know, if you use it as a tool, um, but even more, you need this improv class as a tool, right, Vince? So everyone, <laughs> check out Vince's website, vinceprep.com for more information on um, this improv class. And Vince, this has been a delight. Um, I do just want to ask, because I'm trying to you know, end my podcast with the same question. What is one thing people can do um, that they can give a try today that people are going to notice a difference in their lives? Listen as deeply as you can. The greatest gift you can give someone, the greatest way to, to, yeah, to honor someone your, whether it's your grandmother or or your friend or your spouse or a stranger in the street or someone at the checkout counter who asks you a question, how's your day going? I mean, just give the gift of of deep listening to someone and and notice the results. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I love that. I'm a very emotional person, and I love that one. So I love kindness, and I think that that listening is ultimately just the the biggest kindness that you can express to someone is just taking that time for someone else. So Vince, thank you for taking the time with me. I really appreciate it. Good luck with your class. And um, 
with your back and forth from the U.S. to um, Japan. All the best to you and your family, and I hope that we can touch base again soon. Hope so, too. Thanks a lot for having Thanks. me. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.